Yeah, yeah. Like, geez, almost 10. It's eight. I'm still a youngster. She's a youngster. All right. Um, Yvonne's uh, work, her fiber artwork, are often um, inspired by her surroundings and her experiences, um, especially as a meteorologist. And she never knows where her pieces will take her as they're being created. She'll identify some theme or idea that she wants to explore and express in fiber, and then she'll do research and eventually start gathering materials and jump in and see where the process takes her. So a very intuitive style of creating fiber art, and it's something that Yvonne has been enjoying now for eight years as part of that, yes. and I know from experience that when Yvonne jumps in, she just gets in all the way. Right. <laughs> so there's a whole table here. <laughs> there's a whole table here. So without further ado, this is Yvonne Elon Wallace. Well, kudos to you guys. It's a beautiful day out there. It's not stinking hot, and you're sitting here listening to me. <laughs> Who would have thought? And but I especially, you know, it's it's amazing what the fiber artists have done here, and that you're here to enjoy it. Um, I, before I start my talk, I do want to say a big thank you to the Alberta Council for the Ukrainian Arts for providing the gallery sp space and promoting this wonderful show. Um, I'd also like to thank Sharon Rublai. She herded the gerbils together from the local band members and got them to put up this amazing show and organized all the speakers and things like that. So thank you, Sharon. <laughs> So, well, Sharon talked about the Fiber Art Network a little bit, but I did. I will talk about it a little bit more. Uh, FAN is a cooperative, and Sharon was probably one of the first, you said three people in 1998, that started chatting about how the fiber artists were not really recognized. They didn't have their own people, and they were going to put together a group. And in 2000, they actually had their first show, and since then, there's been a new show every year. And each year, uh, this, the one, each new show travels for three years nationally and internationally. So there's actually three shows traveling at the same time. This is Threads of Hope. We also have one called 2020. And we have a new one called Chromatopia, which is very interesting too. So if you have a chance to go to the fan website and check out the, the latest shows, that'd be great. Or if you want to bring it in as a show in one of the galleries near you, then talk to the fan coordinators. The group is made up of uh, aspiring artists, that's kind of like me, people who want to be artists, and really talented award-winning artists. We have judges, we have authors, we have teachers in the group, so it's a very inspiring group to be part of, and they're so supportive of anyone's, what, every, what everybody is trying to do. It's really influenced my work. I don't know where I'd be today if it wasn't for this group. So Threads of Hope is 55 pieces of art from 50 different artists, and it all reflects on hopes, longings, and desires for the future world. The art pieces flow with the red line, and we all had to coordinate the same red color from one to the other. And with the thread of hope connecting them, thus completing a line of artists joining forces to improve our world. These pieces, and I can speak from my own piece here, a lot of these pieces I think were being completed or being envisioned at the time, just around the time that uh, COVID was becoming an issue in the world and when the shutdown started. So I think there's, you probably see some of the reflections of some of these thoughts and fears about the connectedness to the world. In, in some of this work. It certainly is reflected in mine. I, I started my piece during the first shutdown. Well, I'm mainly going to talk about my piece in the exhibit. I would like to pause and let you contemplate a question. What is the one thing you would hope for in the future? Just think of what would you hope for. It can be a personal healing or hope for solutions on a more global nature. Big or small, what is the first thing that came into your mind? 
Was it related to mental or physical afflictions? Maybe a desire for a kinder society where no one needs to, needs to live in fear or hunger? Perhaps concerns for the future for our living and physical world? So, I have no doubt that amongst these 55 pieces and 50 artists that you might find somebody that reflects to, to what your hope is and what they're talking about. So I hope you find that special piece. Now, this is my piece here. I want you to think about, have, think about four things I'm going to ask, or there's four questions. What do you see? What's your first reaction? What do you see? What symbols or objects come to mind? Where is your eye drawn to? What is the feeling, the story, or the narrative that you may be getting out of this piece? That's really hard, you know, you go through an art gallery and you're looking at all these pieces and you're like, what was the artist thinking? What are some of the supporting casts, such as color, stitch, or other objects or materials that might support this narrative that you're developing in your head? So if you're looking at any of these pieces, follow those four things that I just said. And then look at the, what, um, the information, the artist's title and the artist's statement and see if your narrative of what you're seeing, what, they, what they've got on the wall, is what, you're, what they're saying on their artist's statement. It's always interesting to see if there's the same narrative or is a slightly different narrative. And that's okay if they're different because art's whatever you want it to be. So the questions were, what do you see? What is your eye drawn to? What is the story that you're feeling? What is the narrative? And what can you say about the supporting past of the main object? Now, I'm going to help you a little bit trying to explain what my piece is about, or give you hints about my It's You can have this piece could be whatever you want it to be. I'm going to help you to cheat a little bit before I tell you something about my artist statement. Um, I want to talk about symbols. I'm going to talk about two things today in my artist talk. I'm going to talk about symbols and I'm going to talk about using natural plants from your environment to make your textiles. So the triangle. Well, there's actually a couple of triangles here. It's an ancient symbol often used to represent the divine, mind, body, spirit, Father, Son, Holy Ghost, past, present, future, earth, growth, death, land, sea, skies. I think I could go on and on and on, the, 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 the mighty threesomes. It's a path to enlightenment and it's a revelation. Energetically, if you think about a triangle, the point points to where the energy is going. And if it's on its tip, it also can be, represent the ability for balance. Can you imagine a, a triangle on its tip? how it can stay there, so it represents balance. In alchemy, a triangle pointed up with a line through, as in, sorry, the point up is air and fire, and the point down is water and earth. In mathematics, the notation for the delta represents change. It might be a change in speed, and if it's the other way around, the triangle, it's called a nebula or a Dowling differential equation. We, it re represents acceleration. So a triangle, if you see triangles in any of these things, just think of it, it's, it's change, it's balance, it might be energy flow, it could, it could mean all sorts of things. Now, my triangle is kind of weird. It's not quite a closed triangle. So it kind of reminds you about a spiral, or a labyrinth, and, you, and again, spirals. Where do we see spirals? The Hubble telescope showed us beautiful spiral galaxies. I think our own galaxy is a spiral galaxy. On the oldest pay, uh, cave paintings on walls, they had spirals. So spirals are probably one of our oldest symbols that we have used. And they, it's, it's often um, represents evolution and growth of sphere, symbol of change. Now the labyrinth, we all think of the labyrinth as something for meditation, and it's, it's a symbol of confusion, spiritual clarity, and growth. With my spiral or labyrinth, the thing is about it is that it comes in, but with the labyrinth, often you come back out at the same place. But with this one, it comes out on the other side. So it's a reflection of, we have some sort of change, we have some sort of growth, 
we have some sort of challenge ahead of us that we need to solve. We're going in, but we're not coming back to where we were. And I think that is kind of an, a, a reflection of where I was feeling at the time, is the world is changing, and we're not going to end up where we were before. Another symbol in here is color. We don't actually usually think of symbols as color, but color is very much a symbol. The purple in this world, purple often represents wisdom, creativity, mystery, magic. Now, combined with the red hair, it's, most, it's, it's linked to the most primitive and physical emotional needs of survival and self-preservation. So now you're looking at symbols of creativity, wisdom, self-preservation, energy, confidence, courage, and change. So all these things kind of represent that whole, to me at the time, represented all these things that were going on in my mind. As I said, I was working on this during COVID. Now the browns, you think, well, that's kind of, kind of boring, but brown is actually an earthly balance. So, and it actually, that's also the, the contrasting color for the reds and the purples. Were very, they, they bring up the vivid colors very well. Now I said, look at for designs. Well, you notice in here, there's leaf prints here and here. And all through here, there are leaf prints. So this is part of my eco printing where I take, take plants from my surroundings and I print the prints onto leaves through this a steaming process. So those are the hints about the symbols and I promised to talk about symbols. And now I'm gonna talk about who I am. So you kind of have to guess a little bit more about what my piece is about. So most of you know that, well, and Sharon said I was, no, you didn't, did you say I was a meteorologist? Well, I, you, I was a meteorologist. I was a meteorologist in the Arctic for 34 years. And during that time, I didn't even realize it myself at the time, but I was, I was, had a front row seat to change. Change in the weather, change in the climate, change in the animals, change in the people, change in the whole environment, change in the ice. And what we were seeing was change in how the whole weather machine operated. Because you need the cold air of the Arctic to, to, to generate the type of weather that we have, we expect since civilization started in this world for us. So, and I thought, well, it was towards the end that I, I realized that we were in deep trouble. And I thought, well, you know what? No problem. The scientists are all gonna figure this out. You know, remember the ozone hole in the 80s? You remember the sun, suntan lotion becomes sand sunscreen and we we're all going to die of cancer because of this big hole that was developing all life on the planet was gonna destroy, get destroyed? Well, the scientists got together across the whole world and they came up with a solution. I mean, it's not totally fixed right now but it's on the way to there. So I thought, naively believe that, well, the warming of our planet, well, we can do something about it. The scientists can do something about it. But as we know, there's a whole bunch of politics, economics, misinformation, scientists witch hunts that happened during the period of time, and it didn't happen. So, so we will, science will do something. Science is not dead. Science can still find solutions. Science will have to mitigate where we're going. So in this case, we're not ending up where we started. We will not be ending up where we started. We're going to end up somewhere else, but we have to end up, we have to be smart how we, we do it. So, does my piece make any sense to you when you look at it? <laughs> Well, I'm not, going to, I'm not going to ask you what your narrative is because it's your narrative and it can be whatever you want it to be. Anyways, here is my art statement for Threads of Hope for Environmental Change. And that wasn't a surprise, I bet. If only it were simple to move threads of ideas from science, technology, and leadership through a triangular mathematic instrument to change. The spiral nature of the triangle serves to help reveal hidden things, promote growth and evolution. We need to seek ways to alter politics, breed fear, skepticism into new threads of hope for life on this planet. So I also promised that I would talk about, and I thought I would sure, sure, share, have, have any of you been um, seen a lot of eco-printing? 
<laughs> There's a few that are seated in my backyard. <laughs> okay. Well, I started my, I got really interested. This is, this is all eco printing, all this fabric and this fabric here. So I started my journey with using the, the natural environment around me. Probably around 2012 or 13, I came across a book by India Flint. It was like, oh wow. All she did was she stuck fabric, some pieces of metal that you need as a mordant to, to get the, the dye to, and the, the fabric to stick together, and plants. I got tansy, I got all sorts of, oh, Donna was with us at one time. Remember we had the big cauldron in my backyard and the guy, we had all these plants on all the tables and we had our jars and the fire going and the fire pit and, and this guy has, puts his head over the fence and he sees all these things and I says, oh yeah, he's thinking the witches of making the bath well boiled. <laughs> so that was kind of, Donna was there when I first started my my canning journey. Well, the journey continued. Uh, Focus on Fiber Arts, uh, another great organization in the city, they uh, offered a course on eco printing. And it was pretty simplistic, but it was like, oh, I can dye fabric and I can print on it. Well, that has led a journey. Oh, and then two years ago, you never go on YouTube, you never go on the internet. I came across Jane Dunawald's YouTube video on eco-printing plants with a heat press. You know the things that you make t-shirts with? But you add moisture and steam with this and you get four minutes instead of two hours. Presto sheer, you get this beautiful print on paper. That you can stitch in ink or make into cards or wherever you want or well, also you could use the traditional steaming process and you can print on silks. And this is actually a mirror image of each other because when they're processed, they're like that with the leaves in between. So this is a, a logwood silk. Uh, this is a logwood dye, uh, a bark. And you might recognize some of the plants from around my house. My favorite plant is the sumac. It has beautiful tannin in it. And then you used um, ferrous sulfate, which you think of as rust, but it's not really rust, and it helps to deepen the colors on the eco prints. That'd be lovely. Mm -hmm. So my journey continued, and well, this this piece that I did last year for a Focus and Fiber Art Show actually has a lot of the different eco printed fabrics that I've done over the years. And this is called Racing with My Fearless Inner Child. We all have that fearless inner child that we need to keep ourselves alive and looking for new adventures. So we have logwoods, wells, matters, uh, kutch, let's see, there's iron. There's all sorts of different fabrics in there that have been treated with different there's barks, there's bugs, there's leaves, there's flowers, and I'll show you some of them. I've just been working on three courses at the same time right now, and I haven't finished them, so this is not the completed work. But, <clears throat> what does this color remind you of? Marigold. <clears throat> exactly. This is marigold, so marigold <clears throat> on wool, on cotton thread and on cotton. Isn't that a beautiful color? Mm -hmm. It's like you can't, I don't think you can get this in a, in a commercial type dye. Mm. Okay, you're a smarty pants. <laughs> what do you, oh, what was that new? Oh. <laughs> what do you think, yeah. this, what do you think this is made from? Raspberry <clears throat> juice. Bugs. It is, y'all. Oh. <laughs> this is the co cochineal bug. It's a bug. Oh. So it's, a, it's the greatest image, Yvonne. You squishing bugs in your mortar and pestle. It's stuck in my head. <laughs> well, it would have been a more, it would be a lot more amusing vision if I'd used my husband's coffee grinder. 
<laughs> you, get the, you buy the dried mugs and you have to grind them up. And I was going to use my husband's coffee grinder, but he somehow he just didn't want the idea of the bugs in his coffee. <laughs> so what, what kind of bug? It's a cochineal bug. Cochineal. Yeah, it's only it, the females. Only the females. Can you buy them by the town somewhere? Or you can buy them. Them. You can buy the dried bugs. You don't get the fresh bugs hopping in your house. So work. where do you buy dried bugs? Oh, there's the different just Maywa is an excellent M A I W A is an excellent source for all natural bugs and, and whatever. Um, how many bugs does it take to do <laughs> this sounds like a loaded question here. Is there a joke or something? How many dead bugs does it take to cross the road? <laughs> we all make cook jumping bugs. <laughs> okay, okay. Let me think. How many bugs would have been in there? I think there probably would have been in in like I made a whole dye pot. There's I would think there's about a thousand bugs in it. Well, there's grams. probably about six grams of bugs. Oh, They're not big bugs. Six grams. Yeah. yeah. I can't picture that. Okay. I'll have a little jar. What size jar? Oh, it's a baby food jar. Oh no, no, no. Maybe um, half a baby. Half a, half a baby food jar. Or not even a half a baby. Jar. Those little jam sample things? Those yeah, sample things. yeah, and that, that, that would cook about 20 grams of textile or wool. And then you would yeah, add, that, water. add water. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. And then, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Okay, do you want me to go through the whole process? <laughs> you chew them up and spin them. Oh, you should see my house recently. I had pots outside on the barbecue on little burners and in the house. and. And, and I have my whole laundry room is, is covered in about a dozen different containers of dyes, exhaust dyes that I'm going to use for other things. My husband goes, when are you going to be finished with these things? <laughs> so, so you're going to start having coffee again. <laughs> <laughs> you, you can buy dried blood, bugs. bugs, blend them up, and then you add water and oil or? Yeah. You have to do a few more things. concentration that you want. Yeah, you have to have the right, you, everything is based on weight of fabric. So I, if I, I have to weigh my dry fabric and say it's 50 grams, yeah. then the cochineal might be 10% by weight of that fabric. So I'd be 10% of 50 grams of cochineal plugs. And that'll give me the appropriate amount of dye that'll go in into the fabric. And then you dip it in the hot. Oh, I, I, I uh, actually, you you cook it on the stove at a certain temperature. They, they all different things have different temperatures that they have to be um, heated up to, and you you will leave that that temperature for an hour, and and then you might leave it overnight to sit more. Some you don't, some you do. They're all treated a little bit differently. Quite a process. It, it is a it is quite a process. Is there a is this something you developed or did you No, learn? I'm taking a 12 boy course through Maywell on natural fabric dyes. So this is um, matter, and I've actually dyed some paper too. I'm going to eco print on this paper actually tomorrow. And this is the matter plant. So you see each of the wools and the textiles, they take up a dye a little bit differently. And then you can also shift the dye color by adding iron or other modifiers such as a vinegar to shift this color a little bit. This is uh, Kutch, and again you can tell, lovely brown, but it dyes a little bit different on the paper. How do you spell Kutch? C-U-T-C-H. What is it? It's a plant. Um, oh, is this a beautiful color? This is on wool. Oh, right. This is on wool. Oh. This is the lac bug. Another bug. Lac. Lac. L A C. L A C. So it's a bug that generates a resin around it, like a cocoon. And that resin is actually shellac. So the shellac makers think that the lac bug is the garbage left over, where the dyers think the shellac is the garbage left over. <laughs> so this is another bug in India. This is a bark, it's called from the Brazil wood. Now the Brazil wood has become endangered in Brazil. So they do grow some of them, uh, a lot of it in um, 
in India and Asia, and it's called the, then they call it the Eastern Brazil wood to preserve the species in Brazil. And a beautiful dark purples. That's what you see in here. And here. Is that wool we bought? This is wool. Mm -hmm. This is a Himalayan rhubarb. This is a, this purple kind of reminds me of the, the Brazil wood, but it's a log wood. So another bark, bark, beautiful purples. So what's the color fastness in? They're the all wood? different. They're all different, but the ones that I'm using are relatively color fast. Like you think, okay, I'm going to use blueberries. I'm going to dye my dress with blueberries. Because heck, blueberries stain everything, right? Or ketchup. But in fact, berries, such as blueberries, are not color fast. The, the dye will come out. So over the centuries, because this is an ancient art, really, the dye. Over the centuries, they have found the colors that will be as light fast as possible. That they won't fade. Because that's really important, right? You go to the, all the effort of doing this, and then it goes away. Oh, this is a really neat one. This is weld. And this is uh, made in, a, in a, a steamer with this cloth, I guess. Beautiful yellow colors of weld. So if you didn't buy the extracts or the powdered fibers from places like Maywa, you would need about five pounds of matter root, for example, to dye maybe 100 grams of fabric. So you need a lot of dye stuff. If you wanted to have marigolds, you'd need a whole barrel full of marigold blossoms and flowers to, to dye stuff. So it's, it's more economical. And I like my marigolds in my back here. I don't really want to pick them before they're expired. So, and, and you know, I could go to your yards and pick all yours, but I think you want to be too happy for that. <laughs> have you tried dandelion? <laughs> I, you know, I, to tell you the truth, as I was driving here, I'm thinking, man, oh man, I bet there's a lot of people that would give me dandelion roots. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I have so many in my front lawn, I could probably dye several kilos of, of fabric. <laughs> I have not seen dandelion root. I mean, you can drink it, you can you can eat it, you can you can do all sorts of with dandelion. But I haven't actually seen anything about using the roots to, to make a dye like these. Um, well, I was thinking of the flowers because they have such a strong color. I have tried to eco print the flowers and the leaves, but I'm going to try again because I have so many dandelions around. Surely I should be able to use them for other purposes. <laughs> But uh, I haven't really been successful with them. I didn't hear what you said about blueberries. Blueberries are not light fast, even though you know you get a blueberry stain on your shirt. Oh, they, they don't stay. They're not. Yeah, you, you think it stays forever, but it doesn't. So you can buy this powder from yes. these different bugs. Yes, and and plants and roots and barks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. yeah. No, it's really interesting, and they all have a slightly different chemistry, how you are best to, to process it. But there's a whole range of colors, and then you can shift in one color, you can shift that color just by adding, like this one. This is a beautiful red. This is actually a, co a, a combination of the coach nail bug and the matter. So this was a mat, um, this is the matter. And this is a coach nail. This, can, can you use cinnamon bark? Pardon? Cinnamon bark, is it still um, dye? I have not seen cinnamon bark in the, I've seen, I've used Arbutus bark. I have not seen cinnamon bark used, but that's all experiments that you can try. These are the ones that I know through experimentation over the eons have, have worked and are, are like fast. So yes, yeah, so now I'm trying to take all my, what I've learned in my dyeing with natural with plants and my eco-printing together. And so that's my, my journey this summer. And it's a very busy journey right now. So maybe next year I'll do another artist talk and we'll see where I am then.
Well, on that note, I hope that you will all go through all these pieces and contemplate what you see in them and read the artist statement and see what they see in them. Yeah. That's all part of the fun, right? It's, this is my narrative, not yours. Anyways, thank you so much for coming out.